Welcome uh, to the IISS. For purposes of the recording taking place, uh, my name is Rahul Roy Chaudhary. I'm the Senior Fellow for South Asia at the Institute and Head of the Pro South Asia Program. When India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi took office two years ago, there was a general expectation that his government's position towards Pakistan would harden, but that his center-right government would also have the room to maneuver politically towards a peace process with deliverables, unlike the predecessor Manmohan Singh government. Over the past two years, we have seen both elements of this. Modi's initial outreach to Pakistan, as well as a deliberate intensification of firing across the borders. India's policy towards Afghanistan has also shifted from an initial sense of disappointment with the Ghani government to the supply of arms to Kabul for the first time. The rapprochement between the two has been enhanced by the recent agreement with Iran on the Chabar port lying some 70 miles from Pakistan's Gwadar port. Currently, what are India's policies towards Pakistan and Afghanistan? <clears throat> What could be the implications of Modi's visit to Islamabad in November this year for the SARC summit? What is India's perspective towards the reconciliation process within Afghanistan? It is rare for us to hear an informed perspective on these matters from a retired Indian intelligence professional with 35 years of service. I'm therefore especially delighted to welcome Mr. Rana Banerjee to the IISS this afternoon. I don't think I'm allowed to say much about his career, although I will mention with his permission that he has served in Pakistan and visited Afghanistan several times. Most recently in April uh, this year at the time of the big Kabul bomb blast. Mr. Banerjee retired from the government of India as a special secretary at his external intelligence agency, the research and analysis wing of the cabinet secretariat. Sir, the floor is yours. That's all. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at IISS. I see some very dear old friends with us, and I'm honored that they should have come. Uh, I must apologize. I've uh, been through a very bad bronchial attack, so my throat is not in the best condition, but I'll try and do my best. India's policies towards Pakistan and Afghanistan challenges and opportunities. Well, to begin with, I would like to say that our relations with Pakistan are really a burden of history. We have had four wars over Kashmir, use of asymmetric proxy war, especially after 1971, domestic constituency compulsions, hampering the political leadership on both sides, and accompanying media hype, which makes the process of engagement very difficult. I mean, in recent times, we've had UFA. The, the resolution at UFA was that we would have talks on terrorism. Never happened. Then we had the Heart of Asia meeting in Islamabad, which our external affairs minister attended. There was a bilateral agreement to resume the, the composite or the comprehensive dialogue process. It hasn't happened yet. We've had the SIT special investigation team visit from Pakistan to India after Pathan Court. They visited the Pathan Court site. But soon after, we, we had a very mischievous report put out in the Pakistani media about the exchange or the information exchange not having been sufficiently valuable to them. So, even when the engagement process takes place, mutually exclusive narratives are pursued and talks end in recrimination. So that is why I ascribe this to the burden of history. As Rahul said, the advent of the Modi government in, in India was received with mixed feelings in Pakistan. Just before the elections, there were credible expectations of a BJP win and expectation also of progress because historically, uh, whatever progress had happened in the last 60 years uh, have been when right of center governments were there on both sides. 
Yet there was an intense or even visceral dislike of Prime Minister Modi and expectations of a turn towards ultranationalism in India. And this was borne out, as he rightly pointed out, by the escalated confrontation along the line of control and the international border. So engagement or, you know, meetings of heads of government, the visit expected of the SARC leaders during the SARC summit in Pakistan next uh, winter, or the earlier meetings in Kathmandu, Paris, they add to the atmospherics of the Taat. But do they do enough to overcome the burdens of history? The backdrop, of course, is that of a familiar pattern of escalation of terror. Whenever such efforts are there, they may or may not be connected. We have had Gurdaspur and Udhampur, then Pathan Court, now Pampur. And uh, this process or the cycle keeps repeating. One of the problems that India faces, and this was ascribed, or this was referred to in the recent interview which the Indian <coughs> Prime Minister had to a prominent Indian channel, was who do we talk to? Who from India do we talk to in Pakistan? We have to take note of the reality of dual power centers in Pakistan. Having cast itself in the role of supreme arbiter or defender of Pakistan's national identity, integrity, and interests, the military establishment there finds it difficult to give up the perception or projection of India as enemy number one. So this actually forms the basis of its supremacy in civil society and ensures its prerogative to cast a decisive veto on matters of security, nuclear and foreign policy issues pertaining especially to India and Pakistan. There is also a persisting civil military dissonance on these issues and how there should be a response to these issues in Pakistan. And there are several nuances to the civil military dissonance at different times. And this has to be factored in into India's response while formulating or crafting such a policy. We do recognize Pakistan's serious domestic problems stemming from terrorist attacks on their own establishment, particularly from 2010 onwards, the parade ground mosque attack which, uh, you know, where several army generals, sons and relatives were killed. And also the more, uh, you know, recent December 14 Peshawar army school attack, which altered perspectives even of the military establishment facing this war on terror. So the crackdown under Rahil Sharif's dispensation, it has been very good and effective and timely. But one question lingers in our minds in India. Why is it still selective? Why doesn't it go across the board also against elements which are focused more towards India? You know, the lack of progress in the trial of the Mumbai 2611, the seven accused. While in Pakistani perception, the Kashmir dispute is seen to lie at the center of sterility in our bilateral dialogue. We in India have a reasonable expectation that criminals of the ilk of Zakir Rahman Lakhvi uh, should be brought to book, should be punished. We do understand the difficulties uh, facing the criminal justice process in Pakistan. Chief Justice Jan Jamali of the Pakistan Supreme Court recently talked about the lack of witness protection, the problems in bringing enough evidence to punish terrorists who are implicated in over 100 violent crimes, still they ca cannot be convicted in courts. So this is a problem. Prosecutors and judges face threats of assassination. Some have already been assassinated. The army has had to resort to summary trial process. The constitution has been amended to enable the use of army courts. I mean, this is something the judicial sanctity of which still is not accepted totally in Pakistan. So these are some of the problems that are there. So if the engagement resumes 
and our expectation would be that there should be some progress in the terrorism cases before it happens. There could be resolvable issues in the India-Pakistan bilateral process. And some of these resolvable issues I'll just flag. Sir Creek is one of them. The trade dialogue, call it the NDMA, non-discriminatory market access, or the most favored nation process, which the Pakistanis don't like. Visa relaxations for religious tourism. Even Siachen, some of these issues could be resolved or some progress towards resolving them could happen if there is an engagement process or dialogue. And the importance of back channels. The present government in India, unfortunately, doesn't believe much in the process of back channels, but the recent disclosures made by a former Pakistani foreign minister in his very detailed exposition uh, of the back channel, which almost succeeded the, the Aziz Lamba talks, it laid down a possible framework for the complex settlement of the K issue, the Kashmir issue, through demilitarization, reduced violence, increased autonomy on either side, and by m making the borders irrelevant eventually. So this could be a way forward. Looking ahead, you know, the noted academic, U.S. academic Stephen Cohen perceived in India as being more sympathetic to Pakistan than to us, writes in his shooting for a century about a hurting stalemate. He says Indo-Pak issues are beset by a hurting stalemate due to three sets of factors, visible disputes, identity issues, and strategic pressure points like Afghanistan. I'm going to talk about Afghanistan. For India, in the context of the bilateral dialogue with Pakistan, where we are at present is possibly a tactical position. Engagement with Pakistan, even a modest dialogue, with little or no expectations of results, enlarges diplomatic space for us. Restraint in the face of repeated terror provocations helps, even as we try to hone up our homeland security mechanisms and develop capabilities to respond with a graded riposte for acts of omission or commission that are likely to continue. So through trial and error, we are trying to move or make incremental progress toward middle of the road approaches on contentious issues. Periodic or automatic process of engagement or dialogue resumption could be an objective at a subsequent date. At present, it appears to be more of a pious hope. So much for the Indo-Pak bilateral process. I move on to India in Afghanistan. Now, India has had a traditionally strong ties in history, culture, and trade with Afghanistan. post bonn Accord, we have given to the extent of between 650 to 750 million US dollars for infrastructure development, power, health, and transport specifically, and education sectors to help Afghanistan. We helped construct the 218-kilometer Dilaram Zaranj Highway, recently the Salma Dam in Herat, generating 42 megawatts of electricity was inaugurated. We have helped build power transmission lines uh, into Kabul, and the new Afghan parliament building at the cost of dollar 100 million, 115 million. It stands in splendor today with a copper dome. Those of you, I have seen it only recently, and I was tremendously impressed. It stands in splendor against the stark contrasting ruin of the Darul Aman Palace. In fact, the tourist guides, they talk to us about the Darul Aman ruin and the new parliament as a contrast between the popularity of the two neighbors of Afghanistan. And this has been repeatedly reflected in the various opinion polls about India's popularity in Afghanistan. The rationale of our aid in Afghanistan has had a development orientation. It has been, as requested for by the government of the day, implemented through them. A price has had to be paid 
in terms of loss of lives of our engineers, of our contract workers. There have been terror attacks on our embassy. We have lost diplomatic and military personnel. But we have only one embassy and four consulates, the same as what was there in the 1953 accord of resumption of diplomatic facilities between India and Afghanistan. No new consulates have happened. We do have a strategic partnership agreement concluded in 2013, which provides, among other things, for military training in India and the possibility of equipment supplies on request. Recently, we have supplied, again mentioned by the chair, uh, three helicopters, which were very welcomed, very much welcomed. They want more such equipment assistance from us. Transitions in Afghanistan need a very careful watch. There are three types of transitions happening at present. The security transition, the peace transition, or and thirdly, the, or the peace transition can also be referred to as the reconciliation process, and the political transition. I'll, I'll deal briefly with each of these. The security situation is very grim. There is fluctuating control over the provinces. The Taliban control totally 9 to 11 districts today in Afghanistan, but they have a swathe of control over several parts of the country, the south, the southeast, parts of the southwest, and the southeast, Nangarhar. <coughs> the strategy of war or, or the spring offensive, so-called spring offensive of the Taliban, has been to try and take control of some of the provincial centers. Kunduz and Hilmand have been mainly in threat. But the Afghan National Army, despite high casualties, desertions, disarray, has managed to hold on. It has been resilient and now is increasingly showing better coordination to work with US, NATO, and ISAF particularly after President Obama's new authoriza authorizations, which would enable them to assist more proactively in those select instances in which engagement can enable strategic effects on the battlefield. And now with the decision to keep forces strength at 8,400, not bring them down to 5,500, this is a decision which has been welcomed uh, generally in Afghanistan and by others as well. The reconciliation process, the quad mechanism has been ineffective and stalemated. The Mullah Mansoor killing demonstrated its demise. There is persisting factionalism in the Taliban. The quick succession announced this time of Haibatullah Akhund it papered over the cracks. Sirajuddin Haqqani's statement indicating readiness for talks under Sharia conditions, but not with the puppet of Afghan government, deceives no one. Pakistan professes its limitations to do much more than what it is trying to do in this process. But it does not want to widen the scope of regional involvement in what has to be an Afghan-led process. The political transition. Now, the legitimacy of the national unity government of President Ghani and CEO Dr. Abdullah continues to remain in question, despite U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's statement in a visit to Kabul about its duration, that it will be there for five years. But in the Afghan mindset, two years rather than five years appears to still hold. Ex-President Karzai has spoken of having traditional loya jirkas, which can happen even without elections to parliament. Other political leaders have set up a loose opposition conglomerate, which they call the Guardians Peace and Solidarity Council. It has personalities like Sayyaf, Kanuni, and others joining together loosely. And they talk of having an interim government council and elections after two years. 
the national unity government keeps averring to the fiction that elections could still be held on time with the Walesi Jirga and the Meshrano Jirga as well as the district council elections. But presidential decrees on reforming the election process, making a start in the reform of the electoral process, having new independent election commission observers appointed, that has been, these decrees have been repeatedly turned down by the parliament. So there's a stalemate. And one doesn't know if elections or how elections could be held on time. <laughs> so what then are the implications for India? India seeks security and stability in Afghanistan, like the rest of the international community. Our main concern remains that Afghan territory does not become a safe haven for India-focused terror groups. Those who are known to have linked up with the Afghan Taliban in the past, both to assist them in the Afghan field, but also to train or battle inoculate their own cadres for employment later in other arenas directed against India. India's development partnership has sought to build Afghanistan's institutional and human capacities. We have interests in exploration, copper mines of Ainak and iron ores of Hajikak where we could compete commercially. When Ashraf Ghani reached out to Rahul Pindi, we were prepared to wait it out. The Afghan park relationship continues to go through deep-rooted travails. The attempt, you know, of Pakistan has hosted Afghan refugees for a long time. So they have perhaps the right to, you know, build restrictive gates inside their own territory. But, you know, the perception goes across that this is an attempt to perpetuate the acceptance of the Durand line through the sugar-coated pill of effective border management mechanisms. Now, this is not something which would go down without a hiccup, as has been seen in Afghanistan, particularly the problems recently faced in Angur, Adda, and Torkha. Even today, uh, this is a very sensitive issue between Afghanistan and Pakistan. India must dexterously pursue its abiding objectives. We have the ability, access, and goodwill to reach out to other political players in the emerging, albeit complex, mosaic of the political transition in Afghanistan. But our overall objective remains to contribute and not to compete. Thank you. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, le let me uh, start the <clears throat> discussion session uh, by focusing on one issue uh, that you mentioned and then asking you two questions related to that issue. Uh, from uh, what you said uh, in your uh, early remarks, it seems that, uh, that you see the importance of a political engagement uh, for India with Pakistan, but clearly you don't see that there's much hope in, 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 in the resumption of this formal uh, engagement. So the two questions I have uh, related to this are firstly, uh, the SARC summit in November. Uh, you mentioned that uh, meetings between ministers uh, and senior officials uh, at multilateral meetings uh, or venues uh, in Delhi or Islamabad uh, hasn't uh, been enough to overcome the burden of history, as, as you put it. Uh, but there was a meeting, uh, there was a SARC summit in Islamabad in the early 2000s uh, when uh, the Indian Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee went uh, to Islamabad and notwithstanding the multilateral nature of the meeting, you know, the bilateral impact of that was tremendous. Uh, and I think it sort of uh, set the stage uh, for uh, bilateral relations between, uh, between the two countries for several years, coming s virtually immediately after the border confrontation between the two countries. Do you think that if and when Prime Minister Modi goes to Islamabad in November this year for the SARC summit, that something similar could happen, keeping in view uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi's uh, sense of, of, of vision and, and the importance of legacy. Related to this is a question about back channels. 
And it's an important issue because I think uh, I would agree with, with your view that back channels are important. Uh, but this government uh, seems to be clear that, uh, uh, that back channels really are not relevant when the NSAs of the two countries uh, have a direct link with each other. But the question on this is, what is the Indian intelligence perspective towards back channels? Because in the past, there was always a sense that, uh, that Sati Lamba's channel with his counterpart in, in uh, uh, Pakistan was something that uh, was politically uh, motivated. But there was hesitancy, traditional hesitancy, uh, from uh, the Indian intelligence agencies on this, partly, I suppose, because it wasn't clear that, uh, that where the information was actually uh, going. But let me start off with these two questions, and then the floor is open for other questions. So and should questions. I respond to respond you? And then we'll take that. OK, first. great. Well, you mentioned the history of the, the Sark summit when Mr. Vajpayee went to, to, Laho, uh, to meet with Musharraf. You see, it would all depend on what would be the stability attaching to the respective heads of government. If Nawaz Sharif manages to survive the present you know, political impasse of the Panama Papers leak, and he is still in power by then, and he has succeeded in appointing the next army chief smoothly enough, then I suppose uh, there could be, you know, a similar bonhomie or, you know, follow through good effects of SARC on the bilateral process. But at the moment, I feel it's uncertain and doubtful that it might happen. Mm. That's the answer to your first question. The second thing about the back channels, you see the Janjua Doval process didn't really take off except perhaps one officially acknowledged or two if you go by the reports of a second secret meeting in Paris. Having happened, both sides deny that. Uh, it really never got off afterwards because, as I believe, initially the appointment of General Zanjua as the NSA was the Pakistan military establishment's answer to Ajit Doval because they felt perhaps that both in terms of status, the Pakistani foreign policy advisor, Mr. Sattaj Aziz, was a much senior, much more senior person having cabinet rank. Mr. Doval does not have cabinet rank, though he is perhaps equally or more powerful, but also because of the modalities of uh, the, you know, the past exposure or intelligence background of Mr. Doval, they felt more comfortable to have a general dealing with him rather than a senior political or, or a civil bureaucrat. So that was the basis of having the engagement process at the level of the two NSAs and, and the rapport also was satisfactory. But subsequently after the SIT visit, there has been no evidence of continuing process of this dialogue. So I'll stop there, I think. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to uh, Gautam Sen. I'd be grateful if you could uh, please identify yourself uh, and uh, the name and designation. Uh, Gautam. Uh, Gautam Sen, uh, oh, Okay. If you just wait. Uh, this is for the audio recording. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. With a very well judged and balanced discourse. Uh, it seems to me uh, the government in Delhi is uh, deeply focused on the issue of development. And they really don't want to be distracted. That's also my personal impression talking to people. On the other hand, there's also a sense that business can't carry on as usual. However, that immediately hits the hurdle of a nuclear stalemate, the moment you want to chart a different course. But there is something else, perhaps, which you can elaborate on, that there are changes in the wider geopolitical environment with the US, uh, with uh, even China, and perhaps, to some extent, the EU, which will impact this. Now, do you think this latter transformation in the wider world and Modi's recent visit to Washington underlies that? What is the role of this issue for the, particularly the indo pak should I answer? <clears throat> I don't think it will make much impact on the bilateral process. That's, uh, of course, a personal, somewhat biased view of a, of a, of a chronic, you know, bureaucrat who's seen through all this hype of, you know, 
foreign visits and you know new leadership coming and all that so i don't think it will have it will have much impact as long as we don't develop our own capabilities of homeland defense much more efficiently and proficiently uh, and carry across this message that our military and our security capabilities are better than before i don't think it will happen and it's not happening so far uh, Brigadier Ben Barry. Thank you. I'm the land warfare expert here at the IISS. And I wonder if I could ask you about military to military dialogue. Because um, the, we, we, can, it's, we formed a perception that there would be room for progress on that. And what you have is very limited, principally the hotline between the DG, DGMOs. And actually, compared with the height of the Cold War in Europe, there is much less military-to-military -military dialogue in South Asia. Recognising, of course, that the constitutional position of the Indian military is very different from, from the de facto position of the Pakistani military. I wonder if you've got any views on that. <clears throat> well, actually, you answered the question in the latter part of your statement itself. The Pakistan military doesn't care about military to military dialogue within the Indian military because they believe that the Indian military doesn't matter. And that's the cold essence of it. And in our system, our military works as per the political you know, direction. Just as intelligence agencies do, Rahul asked me an earlier question, what is the intelligence agency perspective on the back channel? We don't have a different perspective than the political governments. So if the government is going for a back channel, or if the government wants military to have a dialogue, military would want to establish contact with Pakistan military. But in the past, what has happened, we have invited them for polo meetings, for you know, other you know, uh, normal uh, contacts, on which there is feet dragging by the Pakistani military. So they look to their domestic constituencies. That too much bonhomie with India, you call the, them our enemy number one. How come that you're going there? So the Pakistan military is always reluctant. In a sense, we can understand that. But like, uh, there is a, hasn't been for this reason uh, too much of military to military dialogue because they believe that mere dialogue with military won't, you know, help them, uh, you know, defrost the process of getting anything benefits from India in the bilateral dialogue process. It's that simple. <laughs> I don't know if I've ha managed to answer your question well, satisfactorily. If, if I may, there is a paradox that um, many Pakistani military officials and many commentators ascribe the development of short-range, low-yield nuclear weapons to a profound Pakistani respect for Indian conventional capability which they see as overhanging the Pakistani conventional capability in the event of a fallout war in the, uh, in, the, in the subcontinent? Well, I am not personally so much convinced about my military's own capabilities, so I don't know. <laughs> Pakistani intelligence may be having better assets and better assessments of our capabilities. But uh, yeah, the nuclear overhang, I mean, the nuclear program has been justified as a result of that, uh, projection of that uh, devastating military capabilities. But even on the conventional front, the Pakistan military, it's a very professional military and it has developed, you know, conventional responses uh, to sort of prevent damage from even, you know, the perceived cold start, which we deny now of ever having had such a doctrine. But they have made arrangements for forward, rapid forward deployment, battalion locations, and new field formation, land acquisitions, purchases have been done, new artillery regiments. Uh, formations have come up. So even non-nuclear military response capabilities on the Pakistani side have improved. So that is at least our perception, or was. I mean, I am retired now, six, six years. But, uh, but I'm surprised that they have a very high estimate of our military capabilities. Uh, Vinod Kumar. Uh, uh, Vinod, just wait for the mic to come. Uh, 
Vinod Kumar, member of the institute, you said that India doesn't know who to talk to in Pakistan. It's the military is in charge. But that situation hasn't changed over the last you know, 60, 70 years. And yet, India did have, which seemed to be on the surface, a productive dialogue during Manmohan Singh's time, especially when uh, Pervez Musharraf was in charge as president of Pakistan. What has changed since 2006 now? Is this the Indian government, the new Indian government has decided to take a tough line, but it seems to be a very incoherent in its policy. I mean, on Patan Court, they'll invite the team and otherwise, you know, start even firing across the international border, not just the Kashmir border. What's going on? Well, I, 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 yeah, you're right in a, in a sense, but, uh, you know, I also mentioned about the nuances in the civil military dissonance in Pakistan, which we have to factor in in our responses. So at any particular time, uh, we have to see if the military leader is stable enough, and then you talk to him. And uh, otherwise, you see if the military is controlling everything from behind the scenes. Uh, how do we talk directly to the military if our political leadership is civilian? So there is that problem. And of course, we know that it is the military leadership in Pakistan that matters, that will decide what they will do to any response from our side. So that is in the back of our minds. But in the context of having dialogue, it's a bit of an obstacle. But I wouldn't say that it, our policies have been incoherent, no. In the beginning, there might have been an expectation or a possibility of playing to the domestic audience just after our elections, that we'll have more mature responses. We'll develop a stronger border response uh, to immediate provocations. But that doesn't work. It hasn't worked. So there has been a slight readjustment to resiling of our Indian position afterwards. And as I said, uh, moving towards engagement, even incrementally, gives you some diplomatic space. So I think we are moving slowly towards that. We are looking at Pakistan to have some matching response on the terrorism side, on the trial of the terror accused. If there is some progress, you might see uh, a, you know, a more uh, focused you know, response which would be uh, acceptable or pleasing to Pakistan also. It is possible, but it can't be one-sided. Philip Martin. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the presentation. I thought I'd, I'd tempt to to ask a question about uh, India's relations with Pakistan. I thought I'd ask one about Afghanistan to, uh, to move to the other, the other side, as it were. I think over the last few years, India has, as you described, been very engaged in Afghanistan, but it's done so, if you like, separately from the, the wider international effort led by the United States. As, as we see the, the US-India relationship thickening up, becoming more strategic, do you think that might change? Do you think India could become more willing to act in, in closer collaboration with, with the US and others in terms of the way in which it uh, engages in Afghanistan? Well, yes, it could. You know, I wouldn't quite agree with you that it's always been done separately from the United States. I mean, short of putting our boots on the ground, we have... Uh, had almost a similar approach to United States. Only thing is we haven't, in our aid projects have been much smaller, plus we haven't brought in our own contractors eh, to the scale that the Americans did. But overall, we've sort of had a you know, common perception on what, how to go ahead, and we've sort of shared with the United States very openly about what we are doing, what is our perception about very many things. In fact, we have a grudge that they didn't really take us on to the extent that we would have liked in you know charting out the course of the reconciliation process they told us to keep out no no you will offend pakistani uh, sensibilities so better you keep out we'll try to see how it happens later on now they are veering around to a, a more acceptable view that no no what you are doing is okay good come in and you know why don't you also talk to the taliban we, we don't talk to the taliban so far but so there is not so much of dissonance between us and india on afghanistan and um, you know, General Nicholson, I, I was in Afghanistan recently in April, and we had a most enlightened briefing from General Nicholson. And we, we are a think tank, I mean, no political affiliations, and uh, detailed, uh, you know, briefing from the resolute mission commander on what is happening on the military front. It was really eye-opening. So, uh, I mean, 
they want us to give more help to Afghanistan, which we haven't done to the extent that the Afghans want. And this is also due to keeping some, you know, sensibilities of Pakistan in mind. So it's a, it's a delicate uh, process. Bhupendra Jasani. Thank you. Thank you, Papa Jasani from King's College London. Sir, I know you so well. Very nice to see you again Ron, after a long time. Uh, I raised this question some days ago under this roof. I re raise it again today. The question is, what bothers me mostly is the nuclear issue. You have portrayed today a, a, a stronger military influence in Pakistan. Now we hear from my previous institute that Pakistan has got more nuclear warheads today than India has. Now, is that going to prov provoke the, the military to, to adventurism? One question. Secondly, the, the, with the nuclear warheads, uh, how safe are they from the terrorism uh, in Pakistan? Uh, I think these are the two very fundamental issue. And third, lastly, if I may, is how does China figure into the, all this? Because this has never been mentioned in any of the discussions here, which, whenever I come to P Pakistan and India issue. China seems to don't exist. And yet, I, I have a feeling that that's a most important element here. Thank you. So to take your questions one by one, you're right. Our assessment about nuclear warheads today in Pakistan they have more warheads than we do, and the stockpile is getting bigger. They are now in a position to uh, produce between 15 to 20 new warheads every year. 45 kilograms of plutonium enriched from four re reactors in Kushab, 60 from Kahuta, and 10, 15 kilograms more. So this would be able to give them between 10 to 15 new unmated warheads every year. So the assessment is that they have about 145 now, 130 to 145. And uh, they say that the estimated time of you know, deployment has been reduced to two hours, effective battlefield deployment to two, hour, two hours. But the tactical nuclear weapons program so far is more, shall I say, bluff and rhetoric than actual reality because their testing is still not fully complete and uh, some of the testing has been even without the use of dummy warheads. So that's a preliminary stage. They are getting there but recently in the US-Pakistan strategic dialogue they uh, took a position that they are not yet battlefield weapons and so this is not in the realm of public disclosure so far. So it isn't that alarming a situation. Secondly, how safe they are. I think they are very safe. And uh, the Pakistan military is quite careful and will ensure that they remain safe. And thirdly, about the military adventurism. I don't think, particularly as also it was mentioned earlier, that they rate the Indian Army's conventional capability very highly. Mm. I don't think the mere fact of having more warheads at their disposal, it may give them some comfort to, before their domestic audience, but it won't provoke the Pakistan military, which I say again is a very professional outfit, into military adventurism. Thirdly, about China. Now, China is totally a supporter of Pakistan in everything that Pakistan does, and this is likely to remain so, even in the Afghanistan process, the reconciliation process. Though they see it get going nowhere, they, they admit it to us, the Chinese. But they are not prepared to put sufficient pressure on Pakistan to change their policies in any way, which way. So even as regards, you know, their nuclear program, everything that is being done in Pakistan is with the Chinese help, knowledge and connivance. Recently, the Pakistanis were found diverting, you know, strategic equipment to North Korea. The Chinese came to know about it, but they haven't done anything much to prevent it. So this is where it stands. Thank you. The gentleman here, yes, please. 
If you could identify yourself. Thank you. I'm Dominic Martin. I'm a British, former di British diplomat. I um, was in New Delhi during the, the Vajpayee Musharraf period. Um, my question also is on the nuclear issue, and it really it is, I'd be very interested in your assessment of how sophisticated you think both the Pakistani and Indian government's assessment is of their respective nuclear doctrines. Do they really understand um, in a way that perhaps the US and the USSR understood their respective nuclear doctrines during the Cold War? Do they really understand how the two governments um, would... Uh, would deploy and use nuclear weapons under what circumstances? And follow on from that, what, what is your assessment of the, the risks of an accidental um, uh, uh, stumbling into some sort of conflict because of a, a failure to appreciate what the other side is doing because of a misunderstanding about what they're doing with their nuclear weapons? Well, to begin with, I must confess that I'm not an expert on nuclear matters. So we do have nuclear doctrine assessment specialists both in both countries, some very good ones, uh, particularly in India, I can vouch safe. But I do not have that knowledge to answer that question which you have asked, that how sophisticated assessments would be about, you know, whether the doctrines themselves are, you know, rational or not. So I'll duck that question. But as regards the accidental stumbling into it, again, I don't think it's very likely. As of now, both militaries are very professional, leaderships are professional, balanced, and uh, unlikely to let this type of thing happen. Again, this is only a, you can say, assessment of a retired intelligence professional now trying very hard to transit into the academic realm. Mm. So. But let me just follow up on, on this, on what you just said, uh, Mr. Banerjee, about I mean, what about issues of misperception, miscalculation, misunderstandings between the two countries at a time of crisis? I mean, we saw that in 2001, 2002, uh, when Delhi uh, unilaterally uh, cut off links, communication links with Islamabad uh, after the parliament attack and uh, uh, when the uh, military uh, operation, well, when the military buildup was taking place, uh, when the Indian High Commissioner Islamabad, the diplomatic personnel were brought back and a message was sent, the High Commissioner came back. Uh, the Pakistan High Commissioner, I still remember vividly, stayed on in Delhi but finally went back uh, to Islamabad. So they, I mean, could there be a sense where, uh, where something happens and uh, on, on one side there is a clear attempt to downgrade communications with each other and could that then sort of follow into misperceptions, miscalculations? Are we uh, on both sides, are we, uh, do we really understand each other that well to ensure that that will not happen. No, I don't think we do, or, or, or I can't say that we can't. We will ensure that it doesn't happen. No misperceptions could escalate, and uh, particularly on the Indo-Pak front, you find the process of history repeats itself, and uh, there are so many other factors. The, the, the domestic media pressures on either side, and uh, the the political stability balance factor on either side the need to play to the domestic audience. You know, all these variables change. Now in Pakistan, for instance, I mentioned this, uh, in the next six months, there will be a very, very touchy process. The, the opposition uh, will try to put Mr. Nawaz Sharif into a corner, political corner, and uh, he will try to stave off the, you know, stepping down from power or, you know, the, uh, having a very credible process of judicial inquiry into the allegations. Now, this process will take him closer to the time of selection of the new army chief, whether he would want to have a new army chief or not. Now, presently, both the Sharifs have a very comfortable equation with one another. And uh, this has a lot to do with the personality of the present Pakistan army chief, because as early as in January, he said that I don't want an extension and I won't take it. So, but now there is, you know, increasing talk about going through with the process of amending the law to have, you know, four-year tenures for all the three chiefs of the services in Pakistan. So that, you know, it's not singled out to be for only for Rahil Sharif. Now, I don't know if uh, the civil society in Pakistan or the political process there would consider this to be a very good thing, you know. So these are imponderables. One, and 
in a situation like this, if there is a provocation, if you know there is some incident which is considered a grave provocation on our side, and there is a need for some response or some, you know, tactical posturing even, is liable to be misunderstood on the other side. So these type of things can happen. And that's why, again, it's a burden of history. Uh, the gentleman here, uh, yeah. Mr. Jalalzai. Mr. Jalalzai. <laughs> if you can identify yourself, please. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Mr. Han Jalalzai, author and journalist. There are speculation in Afghanistan and long-standing worries uh, within the security, military, and political establishment in mm -hmm. Pakistan that as uh, India established separate intelligence agency in Afghanistan, I mean Rama, and uh, they train uh, people for that agency and they send them to Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to carry out terrorist attacks. How do you see this uh, uh, situation? Well, this is a complete myth, actually, because I am not aware of any such, uh, you know, report or even, I mean, it may be a figment of, uh, you know. I'm not aware, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, let me just, uh, I've got one more uh, person I want to bring in. Uh, so let me just ask uh, uh, the, the next two speakers to ask the question, and then I'll, I'll turn to the, the last speaker uh, for a question or comment. Uh, uh, let me go, uh, Viraj and then Priyanjali. Viraj, yeah. Hi, sir. Thank you for your remarks. <coughs> just drawing on uh, Bupendra's question, I just want to know, what does India think specifically of China's, the China-Pakistan economic corridor? and also China's involvement in the Quadrilateral Coordination Group in Afghanistan. We will to the research analyst at WIW, uh, but Priyanjali first, and then, okay. then we will go for one more. Yes. Okay. Priyanjali Malik, um, I had a question, I want to go back to Cold Start. Um, you talked about how, uh, you, you, you've said several times that the Pakistani army is a very professional army. Um, I'm going to push you a bit. Do you think they actually believe in India's Cold Start Doctrine. We, you've said that it doesn't, you know, India, India itself has a very difficult relationship with Cold Start. It probably does not exist. But Pakistan keeps bringing it up in ju as a justification for its development of tactical nuclear weapons. Do you think that they actually, is, it, is this just a debating point, or do they actually believe in India's Cold Start Doctrine, especially given the lack of any observable military preparations for something that would bear out I, let me just take the third uh, person in the last question because I think it may be relevant. Uh, uh, Group Captain uh, Vasim Kutub, uh, who is with, uh, uh, who's the WIWS uh, visiting fellow uh, for South Asia for Strategic Affairs, and is also a senior director of the Strategic Plans Division in Islamabad. Uh, Vasim. Thank you very much. Uh, I, it seems I am the lone uh, Pakistani voice here uh, amongst my Indian colleagues and other colleagues. Uh, I first like to make some comments uh, on because there were a number of issues raised on the nuclear aspect, and then I will pose a simple question to Rana Energy. Uh, first, uh, there was issues about the safety and security of the nuclear weapons. As far as Pakistan's uh, uh, policy position on this issue is that Pakistan maintains a centralized command and control uh, that try to address the issue of safety and security um, uh, as well as uh, their employment uh, matter. That's uh, with regards to this. And regarding the number of weapons, uh, frankly speaking, I don't know uh, how many weapons uh, Rana Energy has said that maybe 145 an assessment. assessment. But if we go uh, by the independent assessments that are there, uh, they give a figure of, say, India having uh, 90 to 110, perhaps Pakistan having a little more, uh, but that's the. Uh, uh, I I do not know how many weapons uh, Pakistan have, and perhaps uh, uh, no one can actually uh, know what weapons India have. How many weapons do they have? Uh, but looking at the fissile material production rates, uh, some people even state, some studies even state the recent study by the Belfast Center or the other, they project even higher figure of yearly uh, development of Indian weapon. I will not go into the details of that, but that's how it is said. Regarding your question uh, about, about the um, cold start doctrine, 
Pakistan certainly believes, and that's why uh, uh, Pakistan has developed a response to it. Uh, retrospectively speaking, if there were no Cold Star, Cold Star Doctrine, perhaps there wouldn't have uh, been any tactical uh, nuclear response to it. And my question to Rana Banerjee now, thank you very much for your uh, very objective uh, and balanced uh, presentation. The question is simple, that you said that both sides are uh, victim of terrorism. And there is a narrative on both sides, media hype, uh, answering to their domestic constituencies. But my question is, these pressures would still be there but shouldn't there be a need to continue the dialogue process? Uh, if this understanding, this broader political understanding is there, perhaps then the media hype or addressing the political constituencies, domestic constituencies can subside to an extent if the people or the public or the international community understands that they would continue with the dialogue process. Uh, that's my simple question. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and I, if, let me answer that equally simply. I too believe that the answer is a three letter word. Yes, there should be. But uh, politically, it hasn't happened. And for that reason only, we, we need to have some concrete gestures on the ground. And what I said about the trial of the seven accused of Mumbai 2611, if there are some material, you know, demonstration of m this process moving forward, it could give this required impetus for the resumption of the process of dialogue. I in belong to, you know, so far a minority of sort of academics in India who believe that uh, the process must go on or must start, engagement process or dialogue process may must start. So I agree with you to that extent. And, um, you know, your comments actually answer Priyanjali's question about Cold Start. Initially, there was a very real, you know, belief in Pakistan. Uh, this, because of the conventional superiority of our forces, we are so much larger than the Pakistan military. And we amassed so much nearer to their border that it does raise a valid perception of a threat so close to, you know, their cities and all that. So it was to prevent against that. The next time it happens, they would be more better prepared for that. They have done already the preparations for that. And so that's already happened. Uh, regarding Viraj's question of CPC and the, uh, regarding China's role in the Quad process, I already mentioned that, you know, they haven't really put sufficient pressure on Pakistan to, you know, try and put more pressure on the Taliban, Afghan Taliban. And the drone attack which took out Mullah Mansoor. Again, there is an element of doubt about the extent of Pakistani foreknowledge about the attack because, you know, a valid passport was found near the incinerated remains of the car. So how come a valid Pakistani passport survived near the, you know, car? So maybe there was some awareness that Mansoor was not becoming amenable enough so he could be taken out. And uh, obviously, officially, domestically, Pakistani establishment would have to be annoyed about this incident. But where it left China, China really uh, was equally embarrassed in the, you know, at the level of the four nation countries. And they, they said that, you know, what can we say about this? So their presence in the four nation group hasn't really mattered much. Regarding the CPEC, it, it's a different situation. It's, it's a very, very formidable economic development project, very important for China, for Pakistan also. And delivery process has already started. Now, there are some problems in its implementation, particularly regarding how the benefits will percolate in which areas of Pakistan will it percolate more in the northern route or more in the already more developed areas of Punjab, the power sector 
projects also. I mean, Gadani has been now uh, kept in abeyance, and Gadani would have perhaps benefited Balochistan more. Similarly, the Gwadar projects, employment of Baloch in Gwadar is very limited. So this is continuing to fuel resentment among uh, Baloch. So Pakistan has to, uh, you know, solve this problem themselves, how to ameliorate injured Baloch resentment about this. But the Chinese uh, will, you know, implement some of these projects and deliver uh, development to Pakistan. And I don't think we have any problems with that. We welcome that development. We have in indicated to the Chinese that uh, we could, you know, think of east-west connections also to the, uh, you know, CPEC corridor once when it is developed in the future. Thank you very much. We have to end. Uh, we've just uh, passed the time for the uh, discussion session. I'd uh, like to thank uh, Mr. Banerjee for coming here and speaking to us so uh, in such a forthright manner, and I think giving a very uh, pragmatic uh, perspective of India's policy towards Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, the requirement for engagement, the problems against it, the opportunities and challenges uh, that lie ahead for India's relationship uh, with both Afghanistan and Pakistan. But I would still say that I, I still see the SARC summit as, as, as a, a potential, uh, if not a perspective, uh, a, a game changer in the relationship. So we'll have to see uh, what happens in November and after that. But I'd also like to thank all of you for coming here and taking part in the discussion. And I'd like you all to join me in thanking Mr. Banerjee.